Okay. I'll exaggerate. I'll just do this. Okay. Let me pull the mic away. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So, um, all right. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Sorry, the points were the story. Greetings, inhabitants of Greenville. My name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church. I come here from Lawrence, South Carolina, dear friends, and I come out here with fellow soldiers of the cross to bring to you the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, to tell you about the saving power of Him, to tell you about the power which He has to redeem you from the curse of sin. Friends, we're here to preach to you concerning the bad news, to tell you about your sin, to tell you about God's judgment, about God's wrath, but then to reveal to you the precious pearl of great price, the gospel message that Jesus Christ came into to the world to save sinners. As He Himself said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Friends, we're here to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for sin and was risen who was raised on the third day, and who is alive today, whom lives to make intercession for the people of God. Friends, we're here to call you to repent and to believe on Him, that you might have eternal life, that you might not perish in your sins. And so for the friends, my dear friends, and I call you that because I care for your souls, I want to look in Romans chapter 1, in the book of Romans in chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 18. And the Apostle Paul writes in verse 18 of Romans 1, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Dear friends, if I could title this message, it would be the the unrighteousness of sinful man. The unrighteousness of sinful man. See, dear friends, we are all unrighteous. Every last one of us have sinned against God. We have a guilt before our Creator by default. I myself as well. In fact, I would say I'm the chief among sinners. But it never negates the reality of your sin. Just because I'm a sinner does not mean that I cannot call you out in your sin, friends. And call you out. And call you to repent. And to point out your iniquity to you that you might be saved as I have been. Friends, I want to warn you about God's wrath as it is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Every ounce of unrighteousness, every idle word spoken, every careless thought that enters into the mind of man shall be brought into subjection under the holy tribunal of the Creator. He will judge you, my friends, and He will find that you have sinned against Him. His wrath is revealed from heaven. Oh, dear friends, and it is revealed against not only all unrighteousness, but against ungodly men who suppress the truth in that unrighteousness. Oh, my friends, I want to say this at the outset. I believe that there is no such thing as an atheist. There's no such thing as an atheist. I'm an a-atheist. A double negative there. There's no such thing as an atheist. And dear friends, the reason I say that is because the Bible says God has made evident the knowledge of Him. He has put forth His truth into the hearts of men that they know Him to an extent. They know His character. They know His attributes to an extent. Friends, you know your Creator. I just ended a conversation with a man who said he was a pagan priest. He was a, a Cherokee priest. And the man graciously and very kindly shared with me concerning his religious beliefs. And interestingly enough, he never denied the fact that he knows that God exists. He knows that the true God that He's guilty in the eyes of the true God. My friends, He never never denied this because He knows His guilt. He knows He's guilty. Friends, do not be so arrogant and so prideful so as to throw your knowledge of God off to the side and continue in your life of sin. Friends, we want you to be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. We want you to be redeemed from the curse of sin. Please, be reconciled to God. We beg you as if we were God's proxy. As if God were making an, uh, an appeal through us unto you, my friends. As if God was speaking through us to you. Be reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And dear friends, I'd like to make note just very briefly on the context of this passage of Scripture here in Romans 1. The Apostle Paul is speaking about the Gospel message. In fact, in verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For that, for excuse me, for in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So here in verse 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul puts forth his thesis statement for the rest of the book. He's going to spend the rest of, of these 15, 16 chapters of the book of Romans unpacking this concept that the gospel is a revelation. God bless you, sir. Thank you. It, the gospel is a revelation of God's gracious gift righteousness. See, friends, this is a concept you must grasp. The gospel is about gift righteousness. That is that God imputes, He credits to the account of the sinner a righteousness that is a justitia alienum, that is a foreign righteousness, something that is outside of themselves. That's the heart of the gospel. And that's precisely why the, the whole theme, really, of the book of Romans is about righteousness by faith. Righteousness that is from God by faith, received by faith, apprehended by faith. Dear friends, this is what it's all about. And so he begins in verse 18 with really unpacking the good news. But notice where he starts. He starts with a very low note. He starts with a very depressing truth in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. The first thing the Apostle Paul sets forth is the bad news. He tells the bad news about man's sin, about man's iniquity, about man having fallen short of the glory of God and therefore incurring eternal damnation. Why does the Apostle Paul begin with the bad news? So that the good news makes sense. Friends, what if I came out here and just began to proclaim to you over and over and over, very repetitiously, I said, Jesus died for sin and He rose again. Jesus died for sinners. Simply believe in Him and you'll be saved. Oh, friends, you would not understand your need for the Savior. You would not understand your need for salvation. I must labor with you. I must proclaim to you the fact that God is holy, holy, holy. He is a just judge and He punishes sin. He has a hatred uh, for sin and the sinner. And His wrath is kindled. And I must proclaim that to you. And you must understand that and grasp that, dear friends. You must get that. The gospel is only precious when it is held up in front of the, the black backdrop of the bad news of sin and damnation, of God's punishment against sin. And so for the punishment. What's that? Can I get it? Can I get it? Oh! What, what is that? How are you? Oh, I'm alright. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah. How is your name? Uh, my name is Lucas. John. Oh, okay. Nice to meet you, John. Yeah. What are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm preaching the gospel right now. Yeah. Can you talk to my friend teach Steve me, right here? Teach me something. Teach, teach me something. Me. Teach talk me something. Can you talk to my friend Steve right here? I got to continue Steve. to preach. What are you teaching me? What are you teaching me tonight? Just keep, keep preaching. Well, let's just engage. Over the oh, mic. Yeah, okay. I engage. You engage with me? Just engage over the mic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you'd like to say something, we have a microphone set up right here. And you can engage over the, over the mic. I don't think what are you saying though? What are you What's telling that? me? What are you telling me? Well, I'm here to preach the, God, the good news of Jesus Christ. What are you telling me tonight? That you must believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from your sin. That's the good what news. What are my sins? What are your sins? Well, actually, interesting you just brought that up. That's exactly what I was about to get into. Yeah. See, here's the thing, my friend. And I'll say this to all of you out here. The Bible says God is a holy and just judge. And the problem is, is He's put forth His law. Not that that's the problem. But herein lies the issue. We have broken that law. Let me ask you, have you ever told a lie? I just told you a lie. What's that? I just told you a lie. Have you ever told a lie before? I just told you a lie. You just told me a lie. I just told Okay, you a lie. so that makes you a liar. Oh, a another liar. one, another command God a gave. Fucking liar. Okay? And so because of that guilt, because of you breaking even just that one commandment. That's why I offered it. And God judged you according to that. Would you be guilty or would you be innocent? On judgment day. What do you offer me? I gotta go, man. Okay, that's a that's a holy Bible. That's a New Testament. Is it Anderson? Do you have a Bible at home, sir? I do actually. You crack it open and, and start reading it. I do actually. Speak Spanish and English. Oh, really? Creado Jesus. Yeah. I speak two Engl three languages actually. Praise the Lord. That's interesting. Well, I'm gonna wear your stuff. Thank you. Okay, you have a good night. My dear friends, as I was saying, God is holy indeed. We have to understand the bad before we can see the good. So God, being the just creator of all things, has been so gracious to each and every one of us. Think about the grace of God in your life, my friends. Think about the common grace God has bestowed upon you. That you have air to breathe. That you have ground upon which to walk. That you have clothes to wear. My friends, every gift, every good gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. Dear friends, God is so gracious, but that never takes away from the fact that He is holy. 
holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. In fact, uh, that phrase I just said, that's not something I came up with. That was actually written in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, when the prophet Isaiah is granted by God to, to see a vision, to have a vision, thank you, sir, to have a vision of the Most High seated on His throne in heaven. And He sees God sitting there. And He sees two angels uh, in, in that throne room. And they're crying out one to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Uh, no, sir. No, sir, we're not, we're not asking for anybody's money. Thank you, though. Thank you. Do you have a gospel track? Did you get a gospel track, sir? Oh, I mean, I don't need one. I go to church every Sunday. Well, you got to be born again. Jesus said if a man's not born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Church attendance won't get you anywhere, friends. you got to be born from above. God's got to do a miracle upon your heart. And so, friends, God is... is and the word holy means separate. means that you're sanctified, you're set apart. God is set apart from what? From evil, from wickedness. Think about the purity of God. Think about the absolute righteousness of God. God has revealed His righteousness in His law. As I was speaking with that man a moment ago, I wish he was able to, or I wish he had stayed longer because I, I was going to take him through the law and show him his guilt. Friends, that's what I want you to see this evening. I want to hold the law up in front of you so that you can look into the law and see how filthy you are so that you can be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. See, the law shows us not only God's character, but man's character, which is totally, utterly, completely depraved. Friends, God has said in His law, you shall not commit adultery. And many people will be quick to say, well, I've never committed adultery. But Jesus says in Matthew 5, if you look with lust, you commit adultery in the heart. Oh, my friends, how many of you do that all the time? God sees the mind and He sees the heart and He sees that your intents are wicked. God also said, you shall not fornicate. But how many people are practicing the sin of fornication? Friends, this will earn you a place in the, in the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. And I certainly do not want you to go there. Another one of God's commands, He says, You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. In other words, you shall not disrespect God's name and treat it irreverently. But how many people do we hear day after day using God's name in such a flippant and, irre and irreverent manner? Oh, dear friends, what a great, a great blasphemy this is before the Most High. And it is serious in His eyes. Here's another one that is a really simple command, but we forget the, the, the weight of how evil it is. God says you shall not disobey your parents. Oh, foolishness is bound up within the heart of the child. Oh, indeed, how many of us in our lives, especially when we were younger, just constantly disobeyed our parents. We were rebellious. And so, my friends, just at looking at these few commands, the, the forbidding of adultery and fornication, the forbidding of blasphemy, the forgetting of, of disobedience to parents, just four commands. And there's six more I could look at. Even those commands, my friends, because we've broken them, we deserve to be thrown into the lake of fire. We deserve hellfire, my friends. In fact, we are, that's exactly where we are condemned by default. There's no hope. We're, we're condemned to this place of torment and agony without hope, without any hope. And that is why the text reads, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. In other words, it is divinely revealed. It is, it is something that is revealed not only in nature, but in specific revelation. That is the Word of God. The Word of God testifies to the wrath of God being revealed. And not only that, but it says, again, as I said earlier, it is revealed against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness against men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Friends, friends, consider this. Every little deed, every little idle word that you spoke, every evil thought you've ever had, every lustful thought that ever entered into your mind will be brought into subjection on the day of judgment. Dear friends, dear friends, please consider these things. Let your mind dwell upon the holiness of God. And it says they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Dear friends, people do not deny the existence of the Most High because there's a lack of, uh, of lack of evidence for Him. People do not deny the existence of the Creator because there's a lack of evidence for His existence. They lack the existence, they, or they deny the existence of God for this simple fact because they have sinned before God. They have guilt before God and instead of repenting of it and believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ, they reject Him. And they just throw the whole idea off altogether. They just throw it all in the garbage and they say, I don't believe in any God. But all they're doing is suppressing the truth that is already in them. God has placed that knowledge of Himself 
in every one of us. In fact, you don't have to convince anybody of the existence of God. I don't either, because they know it. They know that God is real. They know He's the Creator, my friends. He's the Maker and Sustainer of all things. You cannot have a building without a builder. You cannot have a painting without a painter. You cannot have a car without a car manufacturer. And yet people say you can have humans and creation and birds and trees and mountaintops and seas and galaxies and stars without a Creator. That is the epitome of foolishness. And that is why the text reads, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. In other words, God made it clear to them. Dear friends, God has made this clear to you, not only in general revelation, but even raising up men like myself this evening to proclaim to you the good news of Jesus Christ, to proclaim to you the gospel message of salvation, of free grace in Him. Dear friends, this is... This is incredible. The grace of God. He'd raise up someone to warn you. Friends, judgment day is coming. God's wrath is coming. So behold Him coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Every eye will see Him and those who pierced Him. And they will cry out to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of the Lamb. And He who sits on the throne. My friends, the day of judgment is coming. The day of judgment is coming in which the Lord Jesus Christ Himself will judge the wicked. Dear friends, I want you to understand something. Jesus is not some feminized softy that many people picture Him as. He is the Lord of glory. He is the strong rock. He is the mighty Savior. In fact, listen to the words of Revelation 16, or excuse me, Revelation 19. This is describing the second coming of Christ, beginning in verse 11. The Apostle John says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, that is, many crowns. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, listen to this, so that he might strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. Dear friends, Christ is coming with, with the clouds of heaven. He's coming with the angelic hosts. And he will render judgment and wrath. Friends, where will you be found on the day of judgment? Will you be found having found refuge in Christ? Will God find you wrapped in the righteousness of Christ? Or dead in your sins? Friends, don't lose your souls for your sins. Don't lose your soul. Don't be desensitized. Don't lose your soul for your sin. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? It doesn't matter how much money you make, my friends. It doesn't matter how much pleasure you have in this life because it's all going to burn. Live for eternity, my friend. Live for the life which is to come. Oh, many of you are young and many of you are old, but it does not matter. Today could be the day. God could require of you your life this very evening. Be reconciled to God through the mediator of the new covenant, which He inaugurated through His precious blood. The blood of the Lamb was, sl- was, was spilled at the cross. He poured out His life unto death. My friends, believe the gospel of salvation. And that brings me to the next point I want to make. That even though we're helpless and hopeless, even though we are condemned to hell and there's no amount of religious duty, there's no amount of performance that we can, we can offer up to God, there's no good deeds we can give to the Creator because our guilt is, is so profound and so great and so abundant. But the Bible says in Galatians 4.4 4, that when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born under, of a virgin, born under the law, and He came and fulfilled the law, dear friends. He came and fulfilled the law that we broke. Do you understand the glory of this? That God condescends every other religion is like a tower of Babel, building their way up to God, trying to earn their righteousness. And the Bible says God condescends and God comes and dwells among men. The Lord Jesus Christ. It says in John 1 that the Word was with God in the beginning. And then in verse 14 it says, He became flesh and dwelt among us. He tabernacled. That's literally the Greek word he uses there. He tabernacled among us. And what did He come to do? 
Well, I quoted earlier Luke 19, 10, which reads, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to save sinners. And so He comes and He fulfills the law, and then He is crucified. He is betrayed into the hands of sinners. He is beat and whipped and mocked. His own flesh is ripped off of His bones. He is tortured, and He is nailed to the cross of Calvary, and He hangs on that tree. As Galatians 3 says, Cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree. And Isaiah 53.10 says, But it pleased Yahweh to crush him. It pleased the Lord's wrath to crush the Lord Jesus Christ. It propitiated the Father's judgment. See, dear friends, there must be punishment. There must be propitiation. There must be wrath poured out in order for there to be forgiveness. See, that is what hell is. Hell is the unleashing of God's judgment. The unleashing of God's wrath, which He held back from sinners throughout their whole lives. But the cross is so glorious. God unleashes His wrath upon His Son. He crushes His own Son. He grinds Him to dust. He dies for the elect. He dies for His bride. He dies for the church. Christ, God for the creation. The Creator dies for the creation. My friends, does this not grip you? Does this not change your life? How hard of heart must you be to hear this precious gospel and not be changed? My friends, how hard does your heart have to be to hear the glories of the cross proclaimed to you? And your heart is still as hard as a rock. You know what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18? He says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Dear friends, I want to tell you something. If you claim to be a Christian, that doesn't matter. The question is, is the word of the cross the power of God unto you? In other words, is it just something that you do on Sunday or something you did many years ago and you care nothing about now? Or it's just some little ornament in your life or is the cross of Jesus Christ everything? Can you say with the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Oh, my friends, and then he said in the next verse, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. My friends, if righteousness, if your holiness can come apart from the death of Jesus Christ, then Jesus died needlessly. If you could earn forgiveness before the Creator, apart from the death of Jesus Christ, He died a needless death. He died a wasteful death. But no, Every drop of the Savior's blood was, in, was not in vain, but it was in perfect, absolute accomplishment of atonement. So He dies upon the cross, and then He is raised. He is raised on the third day. We see this recorded in, in, in Mark 16, in Matthew 28, in Luke 24, in John 20. Jesus is raised. God appointed four men to chronicle the resurrection of the Son of God. In fact, just to visit another text in this book of Romans as we're looking at, in Romans 4, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 4.25, he says, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. My friends, is Christ precious to you? Is He the pearl of great price? Is He your all in all? Is His resurrection your justification? Oh, my friends, and 40 days later, He was exalted into glory. He was exalted into heaven, seated on His throne in heaven. He is enthroned there as the King of glory. He stands ready to receive those who die in the Lord. My friends, Christ has risen. He has risen. In the, God has exalted Him. He has exalted Him a position that is above every other name that is in heaven. Oh, friends, he is, he is, He's living today, and He will never die again. The book of Hebrews says He died, but He will never die again. In fact, listen to Philippians, Philippians 2.9. The Apostle Paul says, it says, In light of the cross, this is what happened. For this reason, God highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is kurios, that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Dear friends, what you must do in light of the work of Jesus Christ is you must repent and believe the Gospel. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, The time is fulfilled. 
The kingdom of God is at hand. You can take a service for you. It's a gift for you, sir. You need God bless you, sir. You have a good evening. My friends, freely we receive, freely we give. We're not asking for money. I'm certainly not getting paid for this. But dear friends, we care about your souls. We care about where you're going when you die. Be reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He is Lord. He is Lord. And so my friends, Jesus said, as I, as I was saying, Jesus said in Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. The word he uses there in, in the Greek is metanoia. It means to change your mind. You must change your mind from thinking that you can earn your righteousness before God. Thinking that you can be made right with your creator through your performance. Thinking that this life of sin is worth living. Thinking that your sin brings you any lasting joy. For sin is pleasurable for a moment and then it's gone. The pleasures of sin pass away. My friends, and sin will earn you eternal damnation. Galatians 6, the Apostle Paul says, For whatever you sow, you're going to reap. God's not mocked, my friends. God is not mocked. Dear friends, if you, if you sow in this life wickedness, then you will receive eternal damnation. My friends, many of you are bound to the sins of like pornography. Many of you are drunkards. Many of you are bound to your, to your drug abuse. Many of you are bound to your love of partying. Your love of sex. Dear friends, many of you are, are bound in hatred, dead in sin. You need to be saved from your sins. Jesus Christ died for all sorts of sins at the cross. He satisfied God's wrath. Dear friends, this is not just the teaching of Jesus, but the teaching of all the Bible. The Bible says, even in, in Acts 20, that God requires all men repent and believe the gospel. God requires that all men turn from their sin and believe on Christ alone. They put their confidence in the work of Christ for atoning for their sins. They put their confidence in, in Christ. My friends, is your trust in yourself or is it in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is your trust in your performance or is it in Him alone? Is your trust in the Son of God or is it in yourself? Are you trying to be righteous before God by your religion? My friends, turn from this and believe. Believe the gospel of salvation. My friends, believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe the promises of God. The great reformer Martin Luther said, we are saved by believing sincerely the promises of God. In, in, uh, in Romans 4, uh, 3, we see uh, that the Apostle Paul says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Romans 4, 5, for the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited as righteousness. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of your works. It is a gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Hopefully those fireworks stop. Interestingly enough, okay, my friends, I'll give you an interesting thought. Okay, so the Greek word the Apostle Paul uses in in, uh, in First Corinthians, uh, excuse me, in uh, Romans uh, 1 16 when he says, "For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God." Interestingly enough, he uses the Greek word dynamos, which is where we get the word dynamite. It's explosive. It's life-changing. It's catastrophic. My friends, has the gospel has this effect upon your life? Has the gospel had catastrophic effect upon your life? Not for the negative, but for the better. Has God done a work in your heart? Have you been born again, sir? Jesus loves you, man. Sir, you need to believe and, and trust in Christ. Do you truly believe? Sir, it seems you're even slave to your cigarettes there. It seems you're slave to your cigarette. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Be saved from your sin. Jesus saves from sin. Do you realize that, my friends? We're no longer the slaves of sin. Galatians 5.1 says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Dear friends, dear friends, I cry out to you that this evening. As the night comes to a close, please consider your eternity. Consider your life. Would you sell one of your eyes for a million dollars? Would you sell both of them for 100 million? For 200 million? For 500 million? Would you lose your sight for 500 million? No, of course not. No one in their right mind would lose the precious sight. No one in their right mind would lose an eyeball for any amount of money. Because they value their eyesight. My friends, how much more your soul? It wants its lost, it cannot be regained. Once you lose your soul, it's gone. 
friends, we're on the precipice of eternity. We're as if we're about to step off the cliff. Any moment could be your moment, dear friends. You could, your heart could stop beating right now on the sidewalk. Dear friends, 151,000 people perish every day. And the sad truth is, as Jesus said in Matthew 7, many perish. Many go to hell for their sin. And Jesus said, few will there be that are saved. He said, few will there be that are saved. My friends, please. Please give God the glory for what He has done in Jesus Christ. Do not be a fool. Do not be a fool and lose your soul. You know, people sometimes will come by and mock and say stuff. And oftentimes they don't want to start a coherent conversation. But friends, they're being fools. God is not mocked. The Scriptures are so clear on this. Oh, my friends, that which is known about God is evident within you. You know you're, you're guilty before God. You know your Creator. Believe on Christ. Turn to Him and live. Look to Him as the, as the all-satisfying, the all-sufficient, the, the Savior. My friends, please believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't lose your soul for your sins. Friends, I care for you. Don't die in your sins. Please, please flee your sin. Flee your iniquity. No, no sin is worth going to hell over. Friends, weep and wail, mourn over your sin. Come to Christ. He's so precious. He is so glorious. He is so all-satisfying. The all-sufficient Savior. Friends, come to Him. Jesus said, listen to the, to the enticing invitation He gives. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus graciously extends His hand and offers for sinners to come. He offers to receive sinners. Listen to what He says in verse 28. He says, Come to Me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, dear friends. And then He says in verse 30, For My yoke is easy and My burden is light. My friends, there is this dichotomy in the New Testament that it will cost you everything to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's also a sense in which it is the easiest burden ever. The easiest load to carry. My friends, if you repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God will forgive you of all your sins. He will wash your sins away because of the atonement of Christ. He will wrap you in the righteousness of His Son. He will credit you with having lived Christ's life. Do you see the exchange? He takes my sin. I get His righteousness. Friends, this is the great exchange of the Gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Oh, my friends, please put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Trust in the Savior. Friends, trust in you young men. Trust on Christ. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 16.31 Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. As Moses lifted up and the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. That's John 3.14-15. Dear friends, John, uh, John 3.17 For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Oh, you who are troubled of conscience! You think that God has full wrath upon you? And He does if you're outside of Christ. But listen to the words. Listen to the words of verse 17 of the third chapter of John. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge it, but that the world might be saved through Him. Dear friends, how precious this is. The world might be saved through Him. Come to the Father through Jesus Christ His Son. He will take your sin away. Give you the righteousness of Christ. Friends, there is no greater bargain. There is no greater deal. There is no greater exchange than the Gospel message. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. My friends, please. Oh, and you, I want to address you for a moment. You who perhaps say you're Christians. We are in the Bible Belt, so we have a lot of people professing Christ. I want to say a word to you who are perhaps children of Christian parents. Who perhaps are children of, of a pastor, perhaps. 
I want to address you who, who are related to religious people or perhaps religious yourselves, yet are full of dead men's bones, yet you're whitewashed tombs, yet you're sons and daughters of hell, my friends. I want to address you. Examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Look at your life. Ask yourself, if I, if I claim to be a follower of Christ, am I living in accordance to what He says? Am I living in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or am I a hypocrite? Am I an idolater? Oh, my friends, for many years I was a hypocrite. Eight years I lived as a false convert. I was a slave to drunkenness, pornography, worldliness, partying. My friends, I was a slave to sin and I said I was a Christian. I was a hypocrite from the inside out. My friends, Ma'am, you are dressed very nicely this evening, but I want to ask you something. Yes. What, is your what is your soul clothed in? Are you clothed in the garments of Christ's righteousness? Yes. Are you clothed in the garments of the Son of God? Yes, I am. Is your trust in Christ alone, young lady? What now? Is your trust in Christ alone? Yes. I'm learning every day. God is my Savior. I Praise ask for nothing more. God bless you, All ma I need is Him. That's right. He's all sufficient. That's right. God bless you, ma'am. Stay safe this evening. Friends, many of you come out here dressed nicely, but what is your soul wrapped in? So many people preoccupy themselves with how they are dressed and how they how they present themselves physically. In fact, uh, so many so many guys my age they're all worried about being buff, being trim. Girls are worried about getting just the right body shape in the gym. But let me ask you, friends, do you care about your soul? Because your body's just going to wither away. One day you're going to die. They're going to put you in a box in the ground and you're just going to come to dust. Friends, but your soul lives on. Where will you go when you die? You Christians, or I should put that in quotations. You Christians, you who claim to be followers of Christ. You hypocrites, you sons of hell. Repent and believe the gospel. Friends, you who claim to be followers of Christ. You've had an emotional experience. You said the prayer, but you're a hypocrite. Friends, repent and believe the gospel. Who's a special place in hell for hypocrites? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Do you want to know how you know you're a Christian? Do you live in the will of God? Do you live in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, or do you care nothing about spiritual things, nothing about the gospel? Friends, this shows your deception and your self-deceit. Oh, my friends, in closing, I cry out to you who are old, repent and believe on Christ. You who are young, repent and believe in Christ. Oh, my friends, you who are, who are wealthy, repent and believe in Christ. You who are poor, repent and believe in Christ. You who are proud, repent and believe in Christ. You who are humble, repent and believe on Christ. You who are preoccupied with the cares of this life, repent and believe on Christ. And He will not turn you away. My friends, we have seen through this passage in Romans, but also so many other texts in Scripture, so many passages, the good news of the Gospel message proclaimed. That we are sinners, that God is holy and we deserve hell, but God sent His Son to die and to rise again for sinners. And all who believe on Him will be saved from their sins eternally. They will be justified. God bless you folks. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Lord of glory. God bless you guys. Yeshua is Hamashiach. He is Messiah. Messiah of Israel reigns. God has installed His King in Zion and He reigns forevermore. His government will have no end. So friends, as I said, we're, we've seen it here in Romans 1, 18 and 19 that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. And that God has made evident within all of us who He is, that He exists, that we've sinned against Him, and we deserve His punishment. But God has also put it in His Word that He sent forth His Son to die and to rise again. That Son who is spoken of in the Scriptures as the Savior, as the Redeemer, as the Intercessor, as the Son of God, as the Lord our righteousness, as the King of glory, as the Lord of lords, as the King of kings, as the, the Lamb of God, as the promised seed of the woman, the one who was coming to reign on the throne of his father David. It is this one that we proclaim to you, friends. It is this one that we proclaim.
for it is his glory that we are enraptured by. Friends, I want to leave off with this. Give God the glory. Give God the glory for what He has done in Jesus Christ. Give God the glory for what He has done in His Son. Give God honor. Exalt the Lord for who He is and for accomplishing salvation. Oh, all things come to this one end to bring God glory. Everything has been created to bring God glory. Every one of your lives ultimately will bring God glory in its end. Whatever that may be, even eternal damnation or eternal life will, some, will bring God glory. My friends, God is jealous for His own glory. So my friends, I ask that you would give Him glory. I exhort you to give Him glory. Give glory to the one who died and rose, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to let in, let end off in Isaiah 9, beginning in verse 6. The prophet says... For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will accomplish this. Amen. Amen.